Welcome to Crimson Guitars and welcome to a tutorial video of sorts. I have got a rather interesting, uh, it's a, well it started out life as a Warmoth kit guitar uh, that has come in and uh, she's been put together by a friend of ours rather well. Except for the fact that as with most bolt-on style uh, instruments, it needs a shim underneath the neck and uh, Warmoth have put a particularly no low nut on it. It's um, Do you know what? That's not quite true. Uh, the nut's actually, I think, fine. I'm going to put a shim in, and then we're going to see what's up with the nut. Uh, we're shimming the neck at Crimson Guitars. Is putting a shim in a guitar a big no-no? <sighs> no. I just said no three times, four times. I like it. Um, okay, basically, <sighs> Leo Fender himself used to walk around and collect everybody's business cards and uh, he used to use those business cards to shim almost every single neck that came out of his factory. And this practice continues to this day. There was a, um, a new CEO or some such title of Fender who was asked in public by a, a journalist, um, why, do sh why do Fender shim their necks? And... Uh, and he said, oh, we, we, we never shim our necks. And an engineer had to come out and sort of just poke him and say, ah, yeah, we kind of always shim our necks. Uh, so whatever you think of Fender, whether you think they're uh, the godlike geniuses and, and deserve to rule the world or a mass production manufacturing behemoth who uh, should be knocked down a peg or two, how they do it is they shim almost every neck. Uh, and they don't even shim it properly. They've got this little bit of uh, material that they put in. It, it's, it's just a, in the back of the pocket, leaving the bulk of the uh, back of the neck not actually touching anything. And according to the theory of, an, of instrument building, you need to have as much contact between the, every facet of the neck and the body joint as possible. Uh, anyhow, so we're going to make a timber neck shim to uh, improve this instrument. So, nice quilt, uh, mother of toilet seat binding, and it's all quite nice. Um, now, the thing is, we've got a fairly high action still, relatively, and absolutely nowhere to go. So it's either shim the neck or recess the entire bridge. And I don't feel like recessing the bridge. Let's take these strings off. Loosen all the strings off. Now I'm putting a new set of strings on this instrument uh, and we don't need to save these for any reason. For years I saved old strings. But there's just absolutely no point whatsoever. Uh, if you just snap them, or snip them, while they're under tension, most modern tuners will be able to cope with that. But vintage ones sometimes can't deal with the sudden uh, lack of tension. And uh, they, have been known, they have been known to shatter, which isn't a good thing really, is it? And here's what's wrong with this nut. The slots were cut way too shallow and the clients actually put in little pieces of uh, other guitar strings to raise it up, which is actually something I've never seen before, and it's a pretty genius quick fix. If you can't you know, do the super glue and uh, baking powder or any other kind of fine dust trick, and you're in a rush, you know, guitar tech or something like that, um, that's really not a bad quick fix. Now before I, uh, oh that's a bit stuck to the, to the lacquer there, I'm going to just leave that there then. 
Before I took all these strings off and everything, I measured the relief. In fact, that is what his action was at the 12th fret. And I've taped the three um, feeder gauges together so I know what it was. And I know what I need to aim for. It's also fairly high. So I want to put a, an angled platform of wood in here. And that's going to, that's going to be a little bit of fun, actually. Uh, now, Fender and most other people just put a rectangle in there, and there's a small gap on this point. <coughs> I don't think that's ideal. What I want to do, I've got this veneer here. It's about a mil thick, and it's maple, which uh, is, of course, what the neck is currently made out of. And uh, I'm going to score around the neck. No, I lie. As I said that, I thought, nope, if my client sees me with a scalpel anywhere near his... Wonderfully finished, actually. Neck. I might get into trouble. Okay, so that's what we want. And I'm just going to chop that out. And I'm not going to show you how to do that, because if you can't use a saw, you shouldn't be attempting this job in the first place. Our levelling files are very good for... Uh, general general work as well and, uh, and for this sort of job the fact that it's got a handle it just feels much more comfortable uh, than holding or trying to trying to accurately ooh, don't go against the grain bin trying to accurately uh, file something so for this, I do the same motion, but I'm holding the file. And it's a big file, and it's just waggly and weird. Um, or potentially, you go around like that. And again, that's actually quite difficult to get square. Alternatively, you put it in a vise, block it off, do your filing. But you have to move it every face you do. And I don't know, I just feel, I just feel more comfortable like that. Let's have a look and see. Let's just throw it on the floor, shall we? All right, so that's much bigger than we want. And I need... I want it to go to about there. Um, I want it to disappear at that point. So just behind the, uh, just behind the screw holes. And this is where the fun really begins. Japanese saw just to cut it down to size. Whenever I'm working with thin veneers and bits of wood like this, I now use the much vaunted and amazing masking tape trick. I've got a rough side and a smooth side. I want my masking tape to be on the smooth side because that's the finished part. So I've got masking tape that lines up on both sides. And uh, chisel hammer from uh, David Barron. Absolutely amazing. David Barron Furniture.co.uk. And tell him I sent you, because uh, I'm a fan. It would be great if he. Uh, got more sales. Anyway, I'm not using it as a hammer, I'm using it as a burnisher. Burnish the tape down and then a little bit of super glue. Now, this masking tape is much, much thinner. I'm just checking the, the grain direction. It's much less substantial than your average double-sided tape. Plus, as you'll see later, this actually allows me to remove the workpiece very, very quickly and easily with no um, detritus and sticky rubbish left behind. Most double-sided tapes just leave crap and are not worth having. Okay, now this is the edge that we want to make thinner. There are several ways to do this. You can go at it with a, a little plane. Okay. With such a small piece of wood, it's, it's prone to chip out, and uh, 
it's less easy to control. You can go at it with a leveling file, but our leveling files are super fine. I just said super fine. <laughs> uh, my preferred method is actually a leveling beam with some coarse sandpaper on. Can you tell I've just used that to work with some ebony? Now, the beauty of the masking tape trick is that I'm not trying to clamp this bit of wood to anything, which would be virtually impossible. And uh, it's, it's just held down by the super glue and tape. Now our leveling beams are leveled to very, very, very fine flatness on a, a granite, uh, oh my goodness, what's it called? Capstone. There we go, <laughs> capstone, surfacing plate, it's a granite sur surfacing plate. With extremes of temperature, uh, i.e. if it gets really hot, it can move. But um, I've had my ones and checked them periodically for two years now, and they work perfectly fine, and they stay flat. Uh, anyhow, with these, I can now get a nice flat wedge. I've gone off the edge of the bed, that's paper thin there and starting to disintegrate, but it's still about a mil thick at, the, at that end. Now the other thing is, it's actually really easy to lift off, even such a delicate thing. With more substantial bits of wood and the masking tape trick, you just lift it up and pull it and it, it comes off. This one is now much, much thinner and uh, we need to be a bit more careful. And there we go. The masking tape has stuck to itself, but the other sides have left no residue either on my bench or uh, once you've taken it off, or on the bit of wood. And that is now wedge shaped and it goes to nothing. I'm gonna try and give you a close up. So that edge is absolutely paper wafer thin but the other edge is about a mil. And that's using the masking tape trick. I don't know how I would have done it if I didn't know that trick. Okay, here's the neck. That now fits, fits perfectly. We do need to take into account where the, uh, where the holes are, but I'm gonna put that in the neck pocket to figure that out. What you wanna do is drill the holes in the, in the shim slightly larger than they really are. Uh, because if you don't do that, the shim is so delicate, it's just going to split, and you don't want that. That fits nicely, and I'm going to poke through from the back. Um, you can either do it with a screw or a, or a drill bit. And let's, let's go with a drill. Now, I'm going to hold it in place. I, you could glue this down. And if this is your own guitar and you're doing it, you know, and you're absolutely certain it's never going to need to be changed, then that's fine. But um, as a repair, I'm not going to do anything permanent. Okay, so let's just mark the back of that, and I can now see where I need to drill this out. Let's see if we can do this without splitting. Absolutely, whatever you do, use a center point drill bit. Otherwise, you are going to split it out. <laughs> like I split out the base. Oh, of course, because that. <laughs> there we go. I'm just notching out. It goes to zero, and there's going to be contact all the way up the back of the neck. And uh, 
That's that. I'm not going to glue that in. The pressure is just going to hold it perfectly flat. From the side, yeah, yeah you're going to see that there's something that doesn't have a stain on it, uh, probably. But in general, that's how I would suggest you do a proper connection. Now, I need to remove this nut and I want to take the truss rod cover off first so that when I do, it's safe and easy. Now what you want to do is get a nice uh, flathead screwdriver and a little hammer. Here's a prototype. This is one of the first fretting hammers we made here actually. And you just gently tap. Uh, now, actually the first thing I should have checked is for lacquer around the edge. Now I looked. Uh, if you have a lacquered fretboard, you need a scalpel or a sharp knife. And I can't find either. Here we go. Woohoo, another David Barron tool. So just underneath the bottom of the nut, if there's any lacquer, there was just a little bit on there, just pare that away. Otherwise, you're likely to crack the lacquer on the neck, and that would just be sad. There you go. So that just taps away. Now, it should have been glued on with just a spot of glue. There's quite a lot on there, actually, but uh, not a real problem. Now, on how to shim a nut. First of all, I want to clean the bottom of the nut up and drop it on the uh, leveling beam. This is on the, a finer side. That's the beauty of these things. You can stick on whatever grade paper you want. And then I have here a strip of ebony that is uh, sub one mil. It's, it's just, just a little bit less than a millimeter. And all I am going to do is glue my nicely flattened nut down to the ebony. Bang in the middle, hold it down on something flat. And in fact, That stuff is nasty, but super glue accelerator, especially when you're filming, <laughs> speeds things up. In the interests of expediency, I'm going to go with a fine toothed Japanese saw just to cut it to length. And then you chisel away any excess. Okay, now the theory is the theory is that, um, well, there is no theory. Basically, you've got a nut. The nut is made out of a particular material. And uh, if you're making a shim, the shim should match either the material of the nut or um, the material of the neck. Most guitar necks are made out of wood. So as long as it's your, if your shim is similar to the wood, i.e. made of wood, then it should match perfectly fine and uh, give you something uh, worth having. I need to sharpen that chisel. So that wedge is in there. And I have now got a sharp chisel. Gently does it. Excess comes off. Yes, my finger's in front of the chisel. Don't do that. Fret leveling files are just so useful. Here we go. Bit of sandpaper to clean things up. And 
different. You can see a difference in the uh, in the material, ebony and uh, whatever secret source graph tech is. But it's not very obvious. Whereas if you use a, you know, a metal shim or something like that, for one, there's no reason to have a metal shim. Uh, and two, you know, we want it to look as homogeneous and natural as possible. So I'm going to go and do a little bit more, a little bit more sanding. Spot of glue. There and there. And our now taller nut is in place. We have a body. We have a shim. And but let's put it together and see. See how we go. We don't want our shim to move inside the neck pocket, but because it's basically fully fitted, that shouldn't happen. I'm going to be a bit naughty and use power. I'm not sure why I think it's naughty, but, uh, but there we have it. Mm. I feel I need more support. Now, I'm not tightening these up all the way. Use the power drill to go most of the way. I'm going to do the last little bit by hand. That is, that is our job done. The shim is in place and we have another one here, which you can only, you just can't quite see. So, uh, well, let me put some strings on. Now I'm not going to move the saddles just yet. I want to see how much of a difference we've made to this instrument. Just out of interest, in the interest of teaching my grandma to suck eggs, here's how I, uh, how I string up a guitar. Pull the string around and actually go twice around your tuner like so. Push the two coils down and on thinner strings I sometimes do three. And then pull the string through on top of the other coils. And what this does is as I then tighten it up, first of all I've got fewer coils to uh, to wind up by hand. Second of all, as as it tightens up, the string is going being pushed further and further down by the one that's holding it in place. Keep it keep it under tension the whole time. And uh, it's a foolproof foolproof method. I'm actually going to snip this out of the way first. There we go. Let's go again. So, string in place, fairly taut. Wrap around your tuner one or two times. While it's loose, push it down. And your string goes through the hole on top of the coils. Bring it to tension with your hand. And the whole time you're tuning it up, it's under tension. And we can see just how much of a difference we've made to this by the fact that I can't get these strings to sound. So I've got absolutely no height on these strings whatsoever. And I'm just going to whack the saddles up. 
they're not tuned up either, they're not completed to tension. So I don't want to... damage anything. Okay. Okay, I've got the rough height I need and I'm just going to go for it. So this is the Crimson Guitars understring radius gauge. Put it in sideways. Flip her over. Oh, <laughs> right first time. Um, so that is, uh, told me what radius that is. And I can then use it. It's actually quite difficult to see with all this gold. I can use that to adjust. So I've got the correct radius here. Okay, I have the strings on and I was trying to get to a point where I was going to adjust the nut and I thought just quickly, you know, this is a brand new basically neck, just quickly check and see what these frets are doing. I should have checked this beforehand. I'm not sure if you can hear it rocking on almost every single one. So, I think you can hear that. Microphone. What that means is that, uh, this is a fret rocker, it's a, well this one's four-sided, our new ones are five-sided, so you can put it over three frets. If the fret in the middle is high, the rocker will rock and you'll hear it, and that means it needs a fret job. Sadly, this instrument is rocking on almost every single fret. And uh, that means that what I thought was an almost complete job is not. Uh, and it means that this video is actually going to become a lot longer. I'm going to go through how to, how to level frets again. Do you know what? Forget it. I'm not. I'm going to do the job and you are going to go to another video that I've made or another one of four or five videos that I've made on how to level frets and check that out. So, so there. <laughs> We'll be back with some level frets in a minute. Goodbye. We've just leveled the whole, uh, the whole fretboard. We've leveled the frets, we've polished and crowned, and now the nut is massively high, of course, because we've shimmed her up. And what I'm going to do is take, take the string out. This is a half pencil. So basically, as long as it's sharp to a point, and I rest it on the frets, and make a line. That line is the lowest that um, my slot can be. And, uh, and that is what I'm going to cut to. Uh, now this is a, a prototype Crimson Guitars nut slotting file. We're constantly constantly changing our tools and adjusting them and seeing what's possible. So as I approach the line, I put the strings back in and we keep on going. Uh, at the moment I'm doing it like I'm just using my finger because I can see that's massively high. At some point I'll start pushing down at the third fret and looking for a very very small gap there. but. Um, this is so high, it's going to be a little while before we get there. So, holding down to the third, we just see what the difference is. And what we're looking for is an even response across the strings. Maybe a fraction higher on the two bass ones, because they're larger and they vibrate more. But um, the action at the nut is absolutely... Uh, it's of prime importance. This slot is quite deep. I'm going to use a uh, razor saw now. People use um, 
feeler gauges. I, I just feel, basically. That's about right. And there's a little bit too much relief in here. I'm going to lower that down a fraction now and see where we end up. <laughs> 